So we are the Washington RST. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so we're, we're going to discuss just a little bit about what took place over the last, what, hour, hour and a half. One of the things was we discussed unconscious bias. Um, it was a great conversation. We had several videos. Um, it seemed like everyone was heard. Uh, there was group participation, not just at our individual tables, but across the entire room. I would say just for feedback, I would say there was just not enough time. <laughs> I feel like we were just getting ready to get into the meat and potatoes of it, but uh, I saw a lot of value in it. Um, so dealing with unconscious bias, one of the thoughts that came in my head was that we are an RST. We are a team, right? And I know for me, when I go and uh, you know, advise squadrons about certain things like suicide prevention, things like that, and I say, pay attention to your airmen. Be a good wingman, right? Have authentic relationships. We need to do that in chaplain corps as well. We need to do that in our staffs and get to know each other, right? And if there is, we talked about bias, and it may be conscious bias. It was un unconscious bias, now it's conscious, because maybe you learned something, or maybe someone pulled you to the side, and now you know, well, grow, right? Learn, educate, don't be stuck in the mud, no matter the rank. Be mindful and understand where others are coming from, right? And that can be as a chaplain in unit engagement, in counseling, right? To learn where your, where your shortcomings are and, and maybe ask for feedback. Communicate not only with, with, your, with your supervisors, but with your peers, with your RST. Get to know yourself. Maybe there are things you don't know about yourself. And others see it, but you don't. Another big thing that we hit on was um, ag aggression. So there's the microaggressions that are verbal and nonverbal. Um, this happens daily, whether we like to admit it or not. Um, at different chapels, I'm, a, I'm sure of, even in unit engagements. So some ways that we can avert from this or help out somebody, like if you see something, say something. Don't be that bystander next to the person who is getting asked a rude question, right? You know, stick up for them. Tell that person who asked that question, hey, that was kind of rude. You know, ask it a different way. Um, another thing that we talked about was if you're curious, if you're curious about a culture or a religion or your teammate, start the conversation with respect. You know, say why is it that you do it this way versus this way? Is there's nothing wrong with that? Um, and just remember to be kind and to be firm about what you're talking about when it comes to these aggressions. This concludes our brief. Any yes, it does. <laughs> So uh, we're here to represent the other group, um, and we're here to uh, kind of go over the aha moments that we experienced, right? And with those aha moments, it is an effective mindset that drives our behavior. And to drive that behavior, we do it through reflection. And that reflection is a focus on one's self or the needs of others, our resolution versus others' resolution. We want to encourage things to go right instead of waiting to correct them when they go wrong. We experience a learning curve that can shape shift, not just from teams to individuals, but work centers to chapels. This can often be a smokescreen effect on communication as we try to sift and filter our way through our personal and personable relationships. These relations are tied to and by the connection of trust, understanding, and guidance. Much like discovery, implementation, and inclusion of others, to create trust, we must ask. We must discover. To understand, we must open our thoughts, our hearts, and minds. We must understand. And to guide those, we have to include others. The relevance we seek 
can hide the risk to success. This is why irrelevance allows risks to be seen. Hmm. When we keep others out of the process, this forces us to work harder for exclusion and when inclusion can be a simpler solution. Multiple paths are laid out for us to travel, but bias, approach, and experience encourage the steps along the paths we take. The steps we take ensure others can follow those exact steps, and that justification can influence our acknowledgement. So we acknowledge a barrier, and this barrier allows us to fight or flight. And our self-reflection, our experience, our justification is meant to protect us. We protect ourselves from the one thing that can hurt us, and that can be each other. Not all threats are the same. A threat is an intention with warning, and a bias is an intention with action. Mm -hmm. So how do we see each other? Is it family, friends, work friends, RSTs, RAs, chaplains, enlisted versus officers, right? It seems that the correct answer, an unbiased answer, is people. We care for people, we love people, we preach to people, we counsel people, we are here for the people. And our mission is people. Our, fa our faults, our troubles, misunderstandings, titles, they're all part of a way to pull us in differing directions. Take interest into those who are closest to you. Because a lot of you are wondering right now, well that may be my spouse, my best friend, somebody I've worked with for a very long time together, but don't forget we are here together as RAs and chaplains, and this conference is meant to bring us closer together, bring understanding to belonging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chaplain Jones, off to you, sir. <laughs> 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 no, I couldn't say it any better. Uh, Sergeant Rowe, he, he said it good. But it's really about creating an atmosphere where people belong and care. And it seems so natural. We talked about this for a person to act according to their own mindset. It's a default. So it may be powerful if we're just conscious or intentional about our own mindset. You know, I heard a quote from someone once said that the change you want to see must first begin in me. So maybe if we begin to change the atmosphere in our own mind, it'll be reflected and shown in our own atmospheres and with other people around us. So thank you guys, this is our summary and let's continue to grow together. Dr. Nicholas and Chaplain Dixon, if you all could please come up. I'm not sure if um, you all, but I was in one of the groups and they did such an amazing job just to get a chance to, like they already mentioned about those unconscious biases and taking it from something that's conscious, I mean unconscious to conscious and to being able to deal with it. If y'all could please come forward, please. I'll just come to this side because I don't always have a preacher's voice, so, so you can hear me through the mic. But thank you all for the participation that, and the engagement. But I want to say this to us as a chaplain corps. It's important that this becomes the DNA of who we are. We know that from a religious perspective that Sundays are the most segregated times of the week. As chaplains, we are in a unique position to model what togetherness look like. And I'm so excited about the possibility of being that model and being that example. We all come from different places. We all have various perspectives. But boy, it is priceless when we put those things together. And so I encourage us all to continue this conversation, not just in this setting, but in, a, in the field. Uh, on our teams, it has to become the norm. It has to become the norm. And the more we normalize this, the better at it we will be. And then as Chaplain Spencer said, people will be seeking us out to lead these types of discussions in a way that's healthy, in a way that's loving, and in a way that's caring to every person that we engage. Dr. Nick. Uh, thank you. 
Um, just to kind of echo, I don't know if you can hear me, uh, just to kind of echo that thought, you know, at the college, uh, what we're instituted in all of our courses across the bandwidth is the RST concept. And so, bless you, sir, very, very rarely do you hear the, the discussion about religious affairs airmen uh, separate from chaplains. Now, all of the exercises, all of the conversations, all of the discussion is starting to, to, to work through what does it mean to be an RST? Because it is a concept. And so to echo um, Chapman Dixon's word, it's part of the DNA. It's part of the culture. You know, it's just a norm. And so we hope that you would continue that discussion, you know, out at your bases. And that just be just the thought of you don't think about one thing without thinking about your RST partner, whoever that may be, or partners, whatever the case may be. So that's the one thing there. But hopefully today through the experience, you got to share and got to know each other. I know we, we see this all the time when we do this at the college. The first few exercises, it's really kind of quiet. People don't really want to talk, but boy, oh boy, once it takes off, it's just amazing the things that start to get discovered. And so we want to encourage you to continue to do that. We also hope that some of the things you learned and shared and uh, picked up from each other, that just becomes a part of your daily routine now. You know, think about friends, family, coworkers, you know, others, people that you run across in a day-to-day -day basis. Are you thinking about them? You know, uh, every day when I come through the gate at Maxwell, I always stop where the security forces are and I thank them for being out there. Just, and then I know you go out and do the kind of the same thing, but for some of them, you know, that'd probably be the, the most positive thing they might get that day. And so I always try to, to practice what we preach and what we talk about. And so, uh, so hopefully today, you know, I know we didn't get to finish a lot of good discussions, but hopefully got you thinking and get you moved off center just a little bit. So now you go back and hopefully get energized and want to explore this a little bit more. And of course, you know, we're always available. Just give us a phone call. We're in the global. We're always willing to sit and talk and share more as well. So uh, just kind of some thoughts there. And so in the couple of minutes that we have left, if there is someone in the room who has a thought that you want to share that maybe you didn't get to share, now is the time. Yes, ma'am. hey, I'd like to talk to your people about unconscious bias. I'd like to have these conversations. Is there anything at all that we're able to have to support that? Because there's, to my knowledge, it's a dicey topic. People don't necessarily want to support it. Some do, some don't. Um, so I don't know if there is something that we'd be able to say, no, sir, ma'am, the Air Force says we need to be having these conversations. We need to be addressing these issues. And I would like to, as, as the chaplain, that's as soft as it gets, is to have the chaplain talk about it. I'd like to do that for your people. It's a great question, and I'm going to defer to the senior leaders in the room. Policy. Are there policies that allows us as chaplains to engage in this capacity? So I'm going to be a brave soul to address that. Um, so usually when those crucial conversations happen, it's usually from the top down. Um, I, I was privileged at Keesler. Our wing commander got after having those crucial conversations. The thing about those crucial conversations is when you, you know, when people are not 100% on board, uh, that it can go sideways pretty quickly. And my recommendation, and one of the things for us, this is for us internally. We're trying to reimage HC culture. Let's focus on bringing it to our teams and then and modeling it and uh, leading by example that way. I wouldn't take it out broader because our lane is HC, <clears throat> is spiritual fitness, and I know that's an aspect of it. It's a great conversation as you do unit visitation, but we have to have our leadership have our back when we take these you know, uh, so with the team we have up here, they're experts on it. Um, I, I personally, if, if anyone in AETC comes to me and, you know, they want to take it, if it's something that one of the commanders are asking, um, that's a different story. If the commander is asking you to lead that, 
So I would just be careful how I do it. I wouldn't, you know, I, I'm grateful for your heart to want to do that, but I would also say tread carefully and work in sync with your leadership before you do that. I mean, that's my answer. I'm not saying it's the answer, but that's my thought. Thank you, Chaplain Boyd. If I may advise, uh, so we can obviously speak to the religious diversity and religious pluralism aspect of it. I encourage our RSTs to go out and establish relationship with the DNI offices and, and councils that are at your uh, respective locations. So, and, and insert ourselves with approval from our, our, our chain uh, to be able to talk to that piece. But we do have Air Force Policy Directive 36-70 we have AFI 36-7001 that talks about diversity and inclusion and the duties and responsibilities, attachment to 11 competencies that are, uh, we are expected as airmen to have and we have responsibility as leaders to ensure that our airmen have those 11 competencies when it comes to diversity and inclusion, which speaks to aggression, bi microaggressions and biases, et cetera. So the roadmaps have been there for those of us that have been in the military for some time, the policies have been there, the roadmaps have been there, the problem has been in execution, but it's there nonetheless. I hope that helps. Thank Sir, you. could I jump in there real fast? That's a, that's a great point, ma'am. Just the old chiefy chief of me, I got a different way of looking at things. Uh, when doing the research for this, you know, the whole thing on inclusion goes back to 2011, their presidential directives and all kinds of things out there that have been after the military services to promote inclusion and diversity in the forces and uh, and so you know one way to do that is uh, not from a directive order but from maybe a different aspect of how can we be the best rst team you know and you just let it be a natural discussion of job performance and teamwork and then you let the other topics come in such as unconscious bias you let that come in as a discussion not a formalized training and you know we've all been around how many times have we had to go through a program of something right but what if we just made it a natural occurrence to say you know in order to be the best team we have to address this issue whatever it, whatever it may be and maybe today we talk about unconscious bias and that goes back to building that safety and being able to talk to each other it's just kind of a different way of getting after the same thing just a thought we had a question in this, on this side of the room, or a comment. Chaplain Nehoya, good fellow, Air Force Base, uh, Texas. Um, mine is not a question, but I do want to say that, unfortunately, some concepts and constructs are very political in our country. And we just need to be sensitive to that. Unconscious bias is not a new concept. But just because of some political situation, it has become like something new. And it's been politicized. So I think that in our, in our conversations, we have to be very, very careful how we use certain terms and just be aware of that if we really want to be successful. We do not need to use the word unconscious bias to get to what we want to accomplish. That's my comment. Thank you That's so good. much, yes, and sir. I hope that you will continue the conversation. This concludes our time. Have a great Air Force Day. <laughs>